Hello, everyone. Welcome. You're listening to Audiobookish, an audiobook review and discussion podcast. My name's Fahed Rahman, and I'm joined by Poppy Knight. Hello. And today is the second in our special episodes reviewing the books on the British Book of the Year shortlist for audiobook fiction. And we'll be discussing two titles today, uh, Careless by Kirsty Capes, as narrated by Amber Gad, and the Wizards of Once, Never and Forever by Cressida Cal, as narrated by David Tennant. I think we'll start with Careless, and I'll read out the um, blurb for that. Sometimes it's easy to fall between the cracks. At 3 or 4 p.m. on a hot, sticky day in June, Bess finds out she's pregnant. She could tell her social worker Henry, but he's useless. She could tell her foster mother Lisa, but she won't understand. She really ought to tell Boy, but he hasn't spoken to him in weeks. Bess knows more than anyone, love doesn't come without conditions. But this isn't a love story. And would you like to read out uh, Kirsty's bio? Yes, so... Kirsty Capes works in publishing and as a care leaver is an advocate for better representation for care experienced people in the media. She recently completed her PhD, which investigates female centric care narratives in contemporary fiction, under the supervision of 2019 Booker Prize winner Bernadine Evaristo. Careless is her first novel. Okay, so I'll get started on this. I really, mm-hmm. really, 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 really loved this audiobook. <laughs> um, I kind of fell in love with it almost immediately. I think Amber Gad's mm-hmm. narration is like utterly captivating and remarkable and I think it kind of you know this is her first audiobook I believe um and I think mm-hmm. it kind of announced I, I not, not to get too hype about it, but I think it kind of announces <laughs> like a major talent in terms of like audiobook narration so yeah I I really um enjoyed that what were your kind of like first uh, initial impressions yeah so I'm the opposite <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Um, I'm really not a huge fan, um, and largely because I didn't like the audio. Um, okay. The book itself I thought was good, but it, maybe not my kind of thing. Um, but I actually just couldn't really get into the story and judge it properly, because the audio was just really off for me. Okay. Um, so like Amber's narration style really wasn't to my taste, um, and I had some real issues with just the production quality of it. Um, so yeah that that's my opposite views i don't know who wants to go first yeah i i think i think i will i think i'll go first so mm-hmm. um because the reason one of the reasons i've really enjoyed amber's narration is that i've really mm-hmm. felt that she captured bess's inner voice and i think i've, I've i kind of like fell in love with the the character of bess and i think she really captured you know, uh, amber really captured the like the vulnerability mm-hmm. and the snarkiness and the kind of like mature immaturity around um right around that character and i really felt like i was listening to a conversation with her rather than right. being talked to so that's one of the reasons why I... so i like the character and i like the way that amber brought that character to life as well mm. so you talked a little bit there about you had some issues with like the production quality do you want to talk a little bit about that uh yeah but i'll maybe start with kind of what I thought of the yeah. narration style um, and because I don't like giving bad reviews yeah. and stuff because yeah. I can really appreciate how rubbish it is to you know have that criticism or whatever so I'm going to try and be as fair and constructive as possible yeah. and it is very definitely clear even just from our discussion here that a lot of this is personal taste yeah you know um not everyone's gonna like the same narrators we've done quite well so far yeah. we've pretty much agreed on all of them yeah. um so yeah this is very much a yeah be aware that it's personal taste and not take this as some of those really horrible reviewers that are just like this person's awful you know I, yeah. I'm, I'm not doing that but yeah um style just really wasn't for me like the emphasis and pacing and tone that she chose to use just isn't what I would do um, and isn't what I enjoy so much and I thought the narration parts especially were really deadpan and monotone um, and there's there's more energy in the voices um, and some stuff later on but that wasn't really my bag I also felt that sometimes she was sort of trying a bit too hard when she was reading like over enunciated some stuff in some places um, which might be partly down to that you know sort of being quite new to 
uh, reading audiobooks and I can totally understand that yeah when you're reading something off a page you do easily tend to do that but it was it was something that stuck out to me on the style of it um I also felt like her voices were all very similar I struggled to again this is something that people will differ on some people really don't mind about that um but I didn't love it because I found myself listening to part of a sentence and then going oh wait a minute that's such a body talking you know when I hadn't realized it before so yeah I think like I, this I say, is really fascinating because I've got a completely opposite experience yeah. to that I really um I felt that her narration carried so much like empathy and warmth and I felt that the, mm. the, the pace of it the kind of like the uh, like the cadence of her speech I found really engaging mm. is also I think that's kind of quite fascinating that um it is that you I think you you were a little bit bothered a little bit more by it by the cadence and I, again I think yeah. she did like I think she did a fine job with the voices right okay. <laughs> as well I kind of I could always tell who uh, which character was speaking right so, as, as well so yeah it's kind of uh it's really curious that this yeah. this book would be the one where like our different tastes in like I know ear, oh. ear, earring would come out. So um, definitely, yeah. yeah, it's really weird. And uh, yeah, like you say, you know, we listen to the same narration and yet thinking very uh, opposite things about how it works for us, you know. And it's it's that thing. It's the fact that the style didn't work for me. Yeah, but that is an important thing to consider. You know, if you do have the choice between. Um, listening and reading you know that does the style of narration work for you is a big thing you know that's why we have previews um, on kind of you know download platforms and stuff like that so that you can see if that voice works for you I know I've certainly turned down audiobooks before in favor of reading it because that narrator just doesn't work for me um, and yeah that's not meaning there are terrible narrator and no one will like them because someone will love them you know yeah. like like you're doing and because I had a little look at some of the reviews as well and so many people thought she was fab and were absolutely raving about it there was one review that i saw that did use the word monotone yeah um so i like was like okay it's not just me because <laughs> yeah. i was starting to feel i was a bit alone um but yeah so that, that's very definitely a kind of style choice thing and yet for me really not my style and therefore it did impact my listening experience yeah um but yes in that sense of not enjoying giving bad reviews I'm not saying it's terrible I'm saying it it just really yeah wasn't for me there were moments where I, I liked it more and where I got more into it and where I felt the performance was in my opinion better yeah. um so yeah but yeah not all the way through unfortunately yeah it's so it's especially tricky when you're kind of you're doing your first audio but what artistic yeah. decisions you make of course and yeah, how yeah. that's guided by the production company and that, like mm -hmm. you, you like you've mentioned to me before these are usually recorded on quite tight turnarounds yeah that's as well so I just like yeah coming up as well yeah no definitely and so that kind of leads on to issues I had with the yeah with the production quality because as well as not really getting pulled in by the narration I kept getting kind of shoved out of it by like a jolt of feeling that okay, I can hear a, where a cut was there or I think we've switched between takes there and that kind of thing and it really like took me out of it. So like sometimes just where like pauses were just slightly too short where it doesn't feel natural for normal speech or they were slightly too long. Um, I mean, there was one uh, I noted here is in chapter 16 where there was just a huge pause mid-sentence that's clearly just been missed in editing, yeah. um, at least in the files that um, I've listened to yeah. from the publisher for reviewing. I don't know if that's yeah. going to be what you know, oh, which, listeners which, would get. Which, but... which version? Because I, I, download, I think I downloaded the version on Audible. Ah, uh, Okay. Yeah, I'd listen to the files that were from the publisher on okay. there. Yeah. Okay, so in anticipation of these episodes, the British Book Awards sent over us, mm -hmm. sent over to us review copies, and sometimes there might be like discrepancies between what's ends up published on Audible and what we were sent. As yeah, well, I so. mean, I would have thought that the files that we've been sent would be final, especially yeah. given that this was published last year. Yes. Um, okay. You know, yeah. I would imagine that they would send the same files that they send, say, to Audible to upload. Yeah. Um, but yeah, obviously, I don't know that for sure. Yeah. I don't know if there hasn't been any, you know, edits made since. But yeah, certainly in that, which is what I was reviewing, there's, yeah. A, I think some of those kind of pauses and stuff, some of the subtle ones that, like I say, just jolted me out. I kind of doubt will have been changed. I'd like to think that one I spotted in chapter 16 with the huge mid-sentence yeah. pause might have been fixed or yeah. might be fixed um, soon. But yeah, I found there was some like 
quite big volume inconsistencies as well. Where yeah, Chiefs were just I didn't like, notice that. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> Again, glad not just yeah. me. And like, where just like the sound or intonation didn't match. Um, where the sound didn't match, I think a lot of those times were where clearly corrections were re-recorded, but in a different space or maybe with a different setup. Um and they weren't or couldn't be matched properly. Uh, and I can definitely appreciate the logistics around trying to do that. You know, it's something that I, uh, I brush upon in my job. Yeah. So I, I do get that. But yeah, regardless, it affected the experience for me. And then the ones where like the tone didn't match, like the intonation didn't match and stuff. I wonder if that's possibly partly because of this being Amber's first audiobook, you know, that idea of having to match what you've said tone-wise to the previous sentence or when you've just stopped or the last take that you've done is something I think is quite particular to doing audiobooks as opposed to like acting in general and things like that. It wasn't that either intonations were bad in any way, but I think that must be a real skill to really just keep that same flow, that same fluency, that same tone and texture and just matching it basically to what you've done before I can totally understand why if this is your first audiobook that's not necessarily going to be you know a skill that you already have and it's the kind of thing where you know I'm criticizing a lot of these editing things but that isn't really something that a producer can do all that much about you know in that sense you know they can stop and restart but that might mean more you know discrepancy in tone rather than less yes um so I'm kind of yeah, wanting to explain though that I think that's kind of a uh, an effect of the circumstance rather than um, yeah putting blame on specific people. Yeah, and so this is what you'd said before about kind of like the tight turnaround thing. I think there maybe wasn't enough time given to it in production wise. I think some of the stuff could have been if more time had been taken over editing and checking it and stuff like that could have been fixed. Um, and, you know, maybe, like we say, has been in the files that um, listeners might end up listening or maybe even the ones that you uh, listen to. And yeah, job wise, I can totally empathize yeah. with a lot of that. And, you know, the difficulties of editing, I can empathize with from, you know, editing these podcasts yeah. and stuff. I totally do appreciate that. But if it at affects the end your of the day, experience, yeah, expect, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It affected my experience. And yeah, what I got of this audiobook was I didn't find the audiobook very good itself. Okay. That's, that's how I absolutely felt. fine. So we've kind of we've got different mm-hmm. opinions around the narration. I I thought it was brilliant. You thought it was yeah. less brilliant. Um let's yeah. talk a little bit about the uh, story. Yes, so please. I think we mm-hmm. I think you mentioned previously that this isn't the sort of book that you'd normally read. I think that's probably goes the same for me, I don't read a lot Fair. of stories about young pregnant teenage girls. Um, so let's talk about the character of Bess because I mm, really, yeah. I really love Bess. I kind of like fell in love with that character a little mm. bit. I'm, I so wanted her to kind of like make good choices yeah, and yeah. wanted to reach through the audio somehow and just shake her and just, no, don't do that. <laughs> don't do that, Bess. That's the, yeah, so, um, and if, yeah. if a text can make you care about someone that much, I think mm-hmm. that for me, that's like a little bit of magic. So I was just wondering how yeah. you felt about the, the, you know, the character of Bess just mm-hmm. uh, initially. I can totally see why you had that reaction. Definitely. I didn't personally, but as I say, partly because that voice I was hearing in my head didn't do that for me, didn't yeah. pull me into it. And I, I, I tried to separate that and think about the words, but, you know, because that's a more active thing, I didn't quite have that emotional pull. But yes, I did definitely sympathise with it and can agree with you of wanting things to work out for her, being frustrated when she makes the wrong decision. Yes. So yeah, I can definitely see her as a compelling character. Uh, when I listened, I wasn't as compelled as you. But yeah, yeah I think she is a good and interesting character, well-written character. Um, yeah. yeah. So let's talk a little bit about the story then. So mm-hmm. Bess is in uh, foster care. She finds out she's pregnant and the novel is basically her making decisions about what to do with her life after she's fallen pregnant, kind of who Mm -hmm. she tells about it, you know, what decisions he's going to do to kind of like handle the pregnancy, whether she kind of tells her foster parents, whether she tells boy and kind of how she's going to handle 
her ambitions to move away from the place that she's living in with kind of like the realization is if she, you know, does kind of decide to carry this baby to term that those ambitions might be curtailed somewhat. So Mm -hmm. um, how did you feel that that kind of story was handled? What what, what did you kind of like think about that? I thought it was very skillfully handled. Um, And I think it's interesting with that bio that I read out about how clearly there's the whole weight of that PhD behind this. Yes. um, Which is really cool and really interesting. I really, really liked the like criticisms that it makes of the care and foster system um, and highlighting how it makes people into transactions and it calls into question what actual care (laughs) is allowed and is possible and is encouraged within that system um, and what's discouraged and a lot of the complexities around that I thought was really really fascinating and really well done and then (sighs) This is, I mean, it's quite a heavy book in a lot of ways because yeah. it, it talks about, you know, teen pregnancies. It talks about the care system. It talks about mm-hmm. the experience of second generation um, Southeast Asian Muslims. That's mm-hmm. kind of quite a prominent theme yeah. uh, in, in the book and kind of also this, how people get trapped in a place. So I think, uh, mm-hmm. where, where, where is this? It's kind of in she- near Shepparton Studios. Yeah. Is that correct? And how... Mm-hmm that as a a place is really a character that kind of looms Mm. large over all the characters in there and how Bess and her best friend are kind of united in this desire to get away from this place as as quickly as possible as well. So it's kind of a lot of like heavy, meaty stuff. And there's also a relationship with boy kind of, there's hints around grooming and that Mm -hmm. sort of stuff within their relationship because he's considerably older than her as well. So yeah, there's a lot of meaty themes in there. There is, there is. And this is a thing where it's part a compliment and yet me still saying I wasn't a fan. Yeah. Um, in that I thought the things where the characters are just really horrible <laughs> was very well done, uh, extremely well written, made very real. You could see them as real people that were doing these things, saying these things um, and stuff like that, which, yes, is great testament to the writing. But I really didn't like it because it made me angry. It made me so angry Um, and just annoyed, just like physically tense and frustrated. And it made me angry and disgusted and unhappy. And it was that thing. I was I wasn't sad. I was unhappy and and that might be weird, but there's quite a distinction between that because maybe like quite sadistically, I sometimes enjoy listening to sad stories, you know, and really dark themes and tragic stuff um, and putting myself through that emotional turmoil and the catharsis and, and stuff like that. I can often really enjoy that. Whereas this one, I didn't feel like it was that. It just made me wound up. <laughs> okay. And like, and I couldn't enjoy that experience because I, j- I just didn't want to be in that. I didn't want to be that wound up. It didn't feel like a productive wound up for me. It just felt like, I hate these people. I'm angry. I'm unhappy. Yeah. No one's going to want to be around me anymore yeah. <laughs> um, when I'm in this mood. So yeah, it, in that sense, I think it was a very powerful book. Very well done. And for some people, fantastic. For me, that power just wasn't doing the sort of thing I like from my fiction, you know? And that's probably quite selfish of me to, I guess, in some ways, you know, just want to look at the things that make me comfortable, you know? Even if they make me sad, there's, you know, comfort in it. And I'm I'm aware that that in some ways is a selfish thing. But, you know, we've spoken about this before. I like my fiction for escapism and sometimes escapism that does touch on real things. Um, and really connect to the real world but yeah this for me I didn't enjoy the experience even though I can recognize why it was really well done yeah I think in some ways this book is I mean like there's a lot of tension in the book because you know, mm. obviously there's that that looming timeline you know she has to make a decision before a kind of a certain date and yeah what the ramifications of that decision are going to be are going to be like they're going to be like big, big ramifications kind of like either way. So yeah, in some ways this did sort of like play out almost like a thriller in some ways right. in terms of like her trying to, you know, find out more information about herself. I think that's kind of like mm-hmm. one of the big themes is like at that age, do you really know yourself 
well enough to kind of make these life altering and it's kind of like crazy in that in this country that we put kids through that the gcses and a levels and just all right that's going to set you up for your rest of your life <laughs> yeah and it's kind of yeah so um but you know just to get back to kind of the emotional experience you had i still felt really tense mm-hmm. during the book but that kind of like tension was more like manifested as a anxiety for best to do yeah. really well, where I think for you kind of manifested from the sounds of it, it sounds like it more manifested as like a, a deep, like unhappy frustration at the yeah. mess that all yeah. the characters were in. Oh, so yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly that. And knowing how accurate it is to the real world, you know, yes. I have very strong opinions on, a woman's right to do what she wants with her body and having to hear so much of other people's opinions, which I know are in the real world, not just opinions, but enforced practices of what then happens and how rules are made and all that stuff. And yeah, it made me annoyed for that. It made me annoyed that that is a thing in the world. And yeah, I think that's it. I think I was very much just... Didn't want to be confronted with (laughs) the the terrible stuff going on and, yeah, not being able to separate the two, I think. And and maybe partly because of that, not feeling as emotionally in the story. I was seeing it more from that outside, this is a critique on the world thing and I don't like it. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Uh, So, yeah. But as in, I don't like the world, not I don't like what Kirstie's done. Yeah, Yeah. I think... We haven't really talked about Kirsty's writing a lot. I think she writes beautifully. There were um, like some really beautiful sequences, uh, um, especially kind of those sequences with Isha where they're bantering with each other. I think she's got a really great ear for dialogue. Um, and I think the way she writes those sequences where like, it's just the two of them together and they're kind of like mm-hmm. planning on how they're going to take over the world. And you know, those sequences, I think, were really beautifully written, as were the sequences with her and boy um who i think is you know without getting into too many spoilers one of the most detestable characters <laughs> um we've come across in um <laughs> a long time yes yeah, so i just i really enjoyed how she makes you understand why bess is drawn to boy in terms of like making him like attractive and appealing while also keeping you on tenterhooks and in, in terms of the fact that you probably realize this is not a good thing for her in the long run as well right okay it's interesting so i agree with one of your points and disagree with the other so like i'm not sure i agree personally on the stuff with boy i didn't really get that okay um where the connection and the pull was that relationship for me didn't um yeah wasn't as compelling and certainly when you compare it to what we discussed in the last episode about the relationships and the compellingness of the night she disappeared and things like that I'm aware that they're different relationships but even so for me that one fell a little bit flat um but again I don't know how much of that was me not feeling fully invested in the story but yeah I didn't I that one didn't sell to me I wasn't sold I think the reason why it sold for me was that you kind of get the idea quite early on that Bess is even even though she lives in a family, she's kind of quite an isolated character and she's mm-hmm. looking for affection. Mm-hmm. Um and Boy kind of provides some of that affection. He's also a little bit dangerous, which I think <laughs> some teenage girls would be kind of attracted to. So I think that's why I um Fair. and and I think it's a kind of a similar thing with the night she disappeared. I think that's also why those two characters were kind of drawn together. Kind Again, of, she, yeah, yeah, she's you know isolated in her family unit. Yeah, so I think that's another one where, you know, we'll potentially agree to disagree, yeah. I guess, on um, how that relationship worked out. But yeah, but the uh, one with Bess and Ishal I thought was great. Uh, I completely agree with you there. I thought it was fantastically written. And yeah, I really loved their friendship. I loved how Ishal wasn't afraid to tell Bess that she was a shit friend for, yeah. you know, not listening to her about how important her religion was to her um, and stuff like that. I thought that was really good. I really thought their relationship was fab. I also thought the relationship between... Uh, Bess and her sister was really good as yes, well. Yes, um, that is kind of like typical it. sibling, yeah, sibling rivalry. Well, not sibling rivalry, but that kind of like how different siblings have got different statuses. Yeah, fam- but family, also yeah. just there's so much love, like yeah. more in the later part of the audiobook, the real love and connection between them I thought was fantastic. A, well written, and B, that was a, a nice happy thing to yeah. see of like, oh, look, this can be a, a lovely relationship. Um, so yeah, I liked those two. 
Yeah. Um, so um, I think we've got two slightly different recommendations. I rec- <laughs> I'm going to recommend this wholeheartedly. I think Kirsty Capes is a fantastic talent, and I really look forward to seeing what she does next. I've really enjoyed Careless, and I thought the audiobook was absolutely fantastic and i would really like this to actually to win the entire thing um wow. and having not listened to the fellowship of the ring or the sandman yet for me this is out of the books that we've listened to on the shortlist this is the best one so um you guys i imagine a slightly different <laughs> yeah yeah i don't think i'll be surprised to anyone that that is not what i think uh personally about it um but i would say that you know i'm fully aware these are both um debuts you know debut water debut narrator and I think I would be keen to see what more comes of them both in the future. Uh, this one did really miss the mark for me, and I don't think I'll be rushing to listen to the next one. Um, but, you know, I haven't written either of them off. I think there's definitely some potential there for stuff that I'd really enjoy. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, if you did like it, because I was having a look before, I've seen that they're doing another one, the same pair, written by Kirstie Capes and narrated by Amber Gad. There's another one coming out in, I think, July. Yeah. Um, so, yes, I'm not sure if I'll be, yeah, rushing for that one. But yeah. I, I won't turn away if there's something in the future. Um, but yeah, just missed the mark a little bit for me. Um, yeah, and I've just noticed that uh, this has actually been nominated for the Women's Prize for Fiction as well in 2022. So, okay. Um, mm-hmm. I yeah, have so an unpopular it. opinion, yeah, but, yeah. Uh, but that's my opinion. Uh, <laughs> okay, so the next book that we're going to talk about is The Wizards of Once, Never and Forever. Do you want to read out the blurb for that, Poppy? I can do. Yeah. So, the final book in The Wizards of Once Quartet the number one best-selling series from the author of How to Train Your Dragon. Warriors and wizards combine forces against the dreadful power of the King Witch, whose searing evil threatens not only the Wildwoods, but all its creatures. Zar and Wish are on the final leg of their journey. First stop, the Mines of Unhappiness. Here, starvation is never far away for the magical creatures who toil in its horrible depths. Zar and Wish must escape, and fast. Zar needs to take control of his ever-growing witch stain, and Wish must achieve her destiny. But the Tatsal Worm is in their way, a grotesque monster who threatens to block every entrance. Time is not on their side, but the forests are calling them. Will their combined strength be enough for the biggest quest so far, to defeat the King Witch once and for all? And I'll read up. Cressida Cowell's bio. Cressida Cowell has sold over 11 million books worldwide in 38 languages. How to Train Your Dragon is also an award-winning billion-dollar DreamWorks film series and a TV series shown on Netflix and CBBC. The Wizard of Once has also been optioned for a film by DreamWorks. Cressida is an ambassador for the National Literary Trust, a trustee for World Book Day and a founder patron of the Children's Media Foundation. She has won numerous prizes for her books, including the Blue Peter Award, the Ruth Rendell Award for Championing Literacy, the Gold Award in Nestle's Book Prize, the Hay Festival Medal for Fiction, and Philosophy Now Magazine's Award for Contributions in the Fight Against Stupidity. That's a great prize to have. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Cressida grew up in London, and on a small uninhabited isle off the west coast of Scotland, she now lives in Hammersmith, London, with her husband, three children, and a dog called Pigeon. So I think this was a really odd experience, Mm-hmm. For me, because obviously this is at the end mm-hmm. of a series of books and the audio book starts off with a lot of, as uh, Mark Commode would put it, like Basil exposition to kind mm-hmm. of like catch you up to date yeah. in terms of what the previous adventures had been. And I really wish that I'd had greater knowledge or had read the previous book in the series because I think there would have been a much greater catharsis listening to this right, I just I felt you. like I was missing out on something and mm-hmm. I could tell Fair. that if you were a fan of this series this would have been like a really good um mm-hmm. enjoyable experience oh by the way the order book is narrated by um David Tennant as well so mm-hmm. um, what, what were your kind of initial impressions yeah so I same as you I wasn't able to find the time to uh listen to the previous three before going on to this one so I was going into this fresh um but I was therefore quite glad of that recap and for me I thought that was quite good I felt it was quite sufficient I felt I was able to kind of catch up on what happened I agree it probably would have been even better if I'd have you know been really invested in the series but I it certainly wasn't a thing of you know I didn't think you completely lost if you haven't you know I thought that was quite good I did think as like a a slight editorially thing I think a lot of it was like 
repeated a couple too many times and sometimes even with like exactly the same words. Yes. Um, I personally would have cut those out a little bit or rearranged those a bit better so that, yeah, you didn't feel like you were being told literally the same sentence yeah, again. It was a bit, a bit like an info dump, mm-hmm. that one. But it's kind um, of unnecessary if you've not listened or read the the previous books. Yeah, I think well. I think the infos in, in general at that start, it was good that we had that recap. But yeah, a, a slight uh, criticism on the... Yeah, the overall finish of that, I guess. But I did find it very helpful. I was very uh, glad of that. And I think in general, it didn't feel like a, you know, here's a recap that if you had listened to the previous ones, you'd be really annoyed about, I don't think. I think it did work very seamlessly. This is a very much a picky word level um, (laughs) criticism that I would personally... I'm so bad with repeats. and When I'm editing these and listening to how I repeat stuff myself, when I'm talking, I really don't like it. I like to go back and edit and edit and edit. And, you know, I'll when I'm writing things down or like I'm writing emails, I hate how much repeated or repeated words just I hate. So it's definitely yeah. a bugbear for me. But yeah, I thought that was helpful. Um, I also really enjoyed it. Yeah, it sounds like you did as well. I don't know if you've got a particular point you want to start off I Well, okay. So the book has got kind of quite an interesting structure because we start at a certain point and then she mm-hmm. plays around with the timeline a little mm-hmm. bit as well. So I thought that was kind of for a children's book. Uh, I thought that was a really brave decision. What did you kind of feel about the way that initial few chapters kind of like played out in terms of like jumping around the timeline with this um, omniscient Mm -hmm. uh, narrator? Yeah, yeah. No, I thought it was pretty good. And I think it can often be the case to kind of underestimate what kids can handle. You know, I, I think it suits um, fine for a kid's book to do that kind of thing. Um, it's also something that was in um, the Kirsty Capes one as well, of that um, yes. having the future stuff and flicking back. And I mean, obviously, the night she disappeared as well. Um, but yeah, no, I thought it was really good. I liked how it was, you know, you leave the characters in a, a moment of peril and then make us wait for ages while you go back and give us some backstory, uh, which is acknowledged actively in the narration. And um, yeah, I thought it was really good. And that thing of acknowledged actively in the narration literally means it's meta which if anyone's listened to our podcast before you know i'm a huge fan of yeah uh, i really love that i loved how that omniscient narrator wasn't an omniscient narrator as in a really detached nothing to do with the story kind of the author's brain or a godlike figure kind of omniscient narrator it was clearly someone who knows everything but they have a personality you know yes. they have an identity which i really like when the stories that have that that rather than a neutral narration you have a narrator and one of the things that i get the impression is something throughout the series is the who is this narrator yeah which this book reveals um and i thought that was really exciting uh and yeah i i really like that i like that as a feature of a book i think with it being kids as well it adds that extra interest you know it's something um exciting a, yeah and different mystery you yeah know? yeah um which i thought was really good so yeah and i really liked in connection with that Kind of going on to another point that I really liked. I like how at the end they acknowledge that David Tennant is the narrator yeah, that, yeah. of this audiobook. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I yeah. loved it. That was yeah. a lovely little moment. Yeah. Um, and there was some stuff throughout where kind of, you know, it's been made as an audiobook. So things like references to um, the listener um, and listening to yeah. this. Um, I mean, I think there was one if you've read the previous book, but that's debatable whether yeah. you want to change that or not. Yeah. But I really liked that there was definitely some care taken over. We want to make that change, you know, which I think is necessary, but I'm still glad when I see it. And yeah, the extra bit with the David Tennantness, I yeah. loved it. So loved I've it, loved it. got a few comments about what happens towards the end of the book. So I wanted to kind of park that to one side. The... Um, the, the one thing that so this is a really fun book yeah uh, i think mm-hmm. The, the, mm-hmm. the one thing that i really liked was the fact that cressida cow kind of goes wild on mm. the name of like creatures like you know um yeah, things like, yeah. you know the, the tazzle worm and all the different giants have got really wild crazy mm. names and i really enjoyed that and you could kind of tell that david Tennant had an absolute ball pronouncing yeah. <laughs> or, um, all those names i think you could really tell that david Tennant was having a really fun time doing yeah. doing this book kind of um the what's the phrase i'm looking for i think familiarity sometimes breeds contempt and we have listened to a previous <laughs> david Tennant book yes. and he's kind of breaking out some of the similar sort of tricks and similar sort of artistic decisions in terms of like the way he gives uh voices to certain characters as well <laughs> but it's 
when the one trick is kind of like quite that good um, yeah. <laughs> still, yeah, yeah. how can you complain about it too much but yeah what did you feel about kind of like David's like firstly about the names of the characters and then kind of like David's performance oh yeah yeah no I agree I think they're really fab and won't do spoilers but there's some interesting stuff about names of characters at the end of the book yes, uh, yes. which I thought was really cool and yeah wish I knew more about um, and that's maybe something where the children listening to this might not know about, but maybe it's something where they'll find out about it, remember it and go, oh, wait, I've got to go back and listen to that again yeah. and see if I can inform it. So I think that was really good. And then, yeah, David Tennant's performance, he, I mean, he's a great actor. Uh, we know this. I found it really, really enjoyable. Uh, I liked his different character voices. Uh, I thought they were nice and distinct and, uh, you know, kind of, yeah, matched and worked. There was one that I wasn't sure really... Um, matched what was my note here oh yeah so i wasn't sure that the bumble boozle voice really matched the descriptions in the book um, okay hopefully that's all i've written in my notes um, <laughs> so i can't constrictively say it, but i remember listening to the voice and then i think it was like you know said bumble boozle and a, a description about him and to me i was just like they don't add up it wouldn't be okay. my choice but that's literally the only you know performance criticism I have really um as a nitpicky thing I thought the voices were good I thought yeah the captivating narration yeah I really liked it I thought it was good yeah and kind of also there's a, some interesting production decisions in this so mm. there are sound effects in this book so that there are drum beats and I think if I remember correctly was there a clash of thunder as well yeah, uh, so, yeah. yeah, I have mixed uh, feelings on the sound effects. Some of them I thought were really good. Some of them fell a bit flat for me. So, like, there were, it, it, there's not a lot of sound effects in this. Yes, They're sort it's of a very little sparing, bit. Yeah. yeah, agreed, agreed. But so, for example, there was, like, explosion sound effects, right? But to me, that was really quite quiet and sounded more like an aeroplane going overhead than a massive catastrophic explosion and i mean obviously you don't want to do a huge loud explosion that you know breaks the eardrums of the <laughs> of the listeners but it didn't work for me those noises and i think if if there had been more sound effects throughout i feel like those would have slotted in better you know but instead they came out of nowhere and yeah. yet didn't seem to fulfill the purpose so it, that, that didn't quite hit with me but then there were some other sound effects that uh, i thought were really good and it's nice when there are some in there to add a yeah. bit of extra interest and excitement and stuff. I wonder what the editorial like decision behind... So maybe in the other previous audiobooks in this series, there are a lot more incidents where they can use sound effects like that. And maybe in this maybe. particular... Maybe that's, you know, there, there were mm -hmm. less occasions for, yeah. for, for for them to use. Yeah, there certainly weren't points where I felt, oh, where was the sound effect? You know, um, it, it, it was less so much that. It was more just that feeling of when those ones came up, they took me by surprise, but didn't meet it. And therefore I thought if I was expecting them, you know, and I was expecting subtle sound effects, it, 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 I don't know. That was just an idea of what might have made those work better for me personally. But this is something where I really... I'm in awe of the people that do the sound effects and stuff like this. So when it comes to like the editing stuff I was criticizing before, I'm obviously not a, a professional or an expert, but from, you know, a year of doing this podcast and teaching myself how to cut and things, cutting wise, I, you know, I have some skills. I'm, you know, I'm going to be honest. I think I have developed some skills that I'm quite proud of. Um, whereas it comes to how you would add sound effects in, how you would make the decision as to what to add in, how you would find the right thing, how you would make that all work. I have no clue at all, you know? So uh, this is very much criticizing from a position of, I don't know, how you do it better. Um, yeah. And I'm in awe of you that what was done was done. But as a listener, this wasn't my favourite example of them being used, um, or at least not every single sound effect was my favourite example of them being used, you know? Yeah, um, it was just really curious that it was used so sparingly, and I'm mm. just trying to think, does that kind of like make them, when they do occur, more special, or do you need to kind of make maybe make the decision, or we need to kind of use them throughout yeah, a little bit more often? Like the style so it's just across that, that, yeah, the whole yeah. book, yeah. Just similar to that is the fact that how the music is used um, in this as well. Yes, again, I have... Yeah. Again, I have pros and cons on this. So the um, music at the start, I wasn't a huge fan of. 
but that is more just personal taste. I For me, it didn't suit the tone of the book. It just, yeah, it didn't quite hit home right for me. But then again, the music that was used during the songs at the end, I really liked. There was one especially, I think, I wrote down here that I really enjoyed the backing music. Yeah, so what was called the Wizards of Once song, the backing music on that was really cool. And just a fact of it's great for the audiobook and I'm sure we'll be talking about this when we talk about the Lord of the Rings ones next time. Oh, cool, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. But, but the fact that you get to have tune and melody and, you know, potentially backing music like there was here for the songs is something that's really exciting about the audiobook versus, you know, print or ebook. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, what did you think? Yeah, so when I'm reading a book and there's, like, verses in there, that always mm-hmm. kind of, like, makes me cringe a little bit. I, to be honest with you, I just skip past those bits. If there's, like, mm-hmm. a poem or a uh, song verse, I'll just, like, all right, I'm not reading that. Right. get back to the plot but yeah having that uh, musical accompaniment to mm-hmm. you know, David singing I think worked quite well yeah I've got to say I felt like it got to a point where I felt like there were a few too many songs in a row um, yes yeah uh, personally I felt if they'd have been more interspersed throughout I think again with knowing Lord of the Rings ones and how they're more spaced for me I did go oh my god another one <laughs> yeah. um but then I enjoyed it so it was okay yeah. um and that is obviously more of the writing than the audio and I think again yeah if you're reading it maybe it doesn't quite have that same oh here there's another song or maybe if with your experience there of thinking oh god here's one then maybe you'd think the same so yeah yeah. but also I understand why all the songs were where they were you know um it was the whole thing that everyone was singing and uh and lots of songs and celebrating so yes I thought they were good but I did think okay another one (laughs) but it was good but then another yeah so, um, so we haven't really talked a lot about the story itself. It's um, it's a, mm-hmm. an adventure story, a coming of age story. You know, Zar and Wish are both flawed characters in their own mm-hmm. way. Kind of Zar is kind of like uh, I don't know, arrogant, but he's a very kind of sort of yeah. I think um, arrogance fair. Yeah, arrogant, <laughs> arrogant young lad who maybe has ideas above his station and wishes. How would you categorize? How would you describe her? Because you know, obviously, there's a, a steel underneath there, but there seems to be kind of a a big element of self-doubt in some of Mm -hmm. her actions as well. Yeah, there's this thing of like, so Wish being the daughter of a warrior queen, you know, and yet not really wanting war, you know, wanting peace and happiness and friendship um, and sort of the suggestion that that's maybe a weakness in some ways. Um, And I really liked in the book how it talks very honestly about how there's both strength and weakness in that, you know? It's not a kind of, you know, fable of you should be confident or you should be kind or if you're too kind, you're too weak. Or There's, there's no straightforward message. It really accurately talks about how it's complex you know you need a little bit of both you need a little bit of love you need a little bit of uh willing to stick up for yourself and willing to fight for it um but yeah yeah, it was i thought that was a really nice uh kind of overall thesis on yeah Yeah. what's important and a lovely again you know taking into consideration the fact that this is a kid's book you know it's a very mature and helpful thing of you know be emotionally you know emotionally healthy yeah. uh, and that kind of thing a, a good share of all yeah. um traits yeah. you know rather than you know you have to be big strong macho yeah. or you should only be soft and caring and kind to everyone yeah. and get pushed over yeah. you know it, it did a really good um look at that balance through these two characters and their journey which yeah. i thought was really nice yeah because they each got qualities the other kind of at lax mm-hmm. a little in a bit, sort of um wizard of oz kind of um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> needs a heart needs a, needs a brain <laughs> needs, needs a some brain. courage kind um, of thing yeah kind of the other interesting theme i felt that was running through this particular book and we're not able to speak to what happens in the other book is kind of a challenging of traditions and finding new yeah. ways to mm-hmm. live not just with your family um, and the people in your own community but you're know, finding new ways to live with people in differing communities as well mm. kind of trying to you know realizing that you know forging a future after war is not always like the easiest yeah. thing to do but like it's ultimately the only thing that you can do mm. as well so um i thought that was kind of quite a deep message um, yeah, I can well. agree with you there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How did you feel about Cressida's use of language? Because I do appreciate this is like a children's book, but I felt like there were some points that she might have been a little bit more ambitious with some of the words that she might have chosen to kind of like narrate it. 
I think, again, my opinion is a bit like I said before. I think it's easy to underestimate yeah. what kids, you know, can handle um, and stuff like that. I didn't particularly flag that there was anything um, kind of vocabulary choice wise that I, you know, nothing stood out to me yeah. in that kind of way. Um, and I think it's good for there to be words in there that, you know, kids might not know. Yeah. Because it has that thing of, you know, maybe they'll ask an adult what it means or maybe they'll be able to figure out from context and they'll learn a new word through that. Yeah. And I think it is very important that kids' books aren't dumbed down. Yeah. You know, I mean, obviously be aware of, you know, the style of writing that you use and what they're likely to know and not know. You know, definitely be aware of your audience. Um, but yeah, definitely not dumbing it down either, yeah. I don't think. So. Yeah, so I mean... <sighs> At risk of repeating myself I, I really enjoyed this book I wish I had the greater context of like the larger the story to to fully mm -hmm. enjoy it I think this series is I think probably one I'll be recommending to like the young readers in my life nice, I think it's kind yeah. of like I think it's, it's it seems like great fun and yeah like Cressida I think writes like wonderfully well, the way she gets her characters bickering with each mm. other I think is like quite a lot of fun and she's got a really great way of capturing these like complex family dynamics between yeah. like children that want to go in a certain direction and parents who have got a certain uh view of the world and how things should be done to uh, kind of uphold the honor of the house and that sort of stuff i really enjoy the way she captures that um then i mean she writes fantastic like action sequences as well kind of like the mm -hmm. ending action sequence to this was like uh, wow it was, it was like so engaging um mm. and Again, there was a few sound effects, but yeah, David did a beautiful job of like bringing those action sequences mm -hmm. uh, to life as well. Yeah, no, I, th I think I agree with you there. And I think I probably will um, listen to this again and, you know, start from the beginning of the series and listen through. I think it's maybe one where if I want something comforting to listen to going to sleep but that's new enough um to hold my interest yes and that's something that I love doing as a kid I would listen to audiobooks going to sleep so yeah I think this is the kind of thing that I'd like to listen again and would be nice for that sort of comforting thing there and like you say would recommend to other people uh I think we possibly had the um How to Train Your Dragon audiobooks when I was younger yeah but I actually had like quite a lull in audiobooks at that sort of age of story like bracket um you know i had a lot of much younger titles in audio and then you know moved on to adult ones afterwards and i didn't have a load there and i'm you know i'm not sure exactly why that was um but i like that there's more coming up you know as audio is increasing as there's more and more audio books there are more and more audio books in that you know, in that age range. You know, I ended up, I read quite a lot of books in that age range. I didn't listen to as many books in that age range. So it, it's really nice that they are definitely out there and yeah, growing as the whole audiobook industry grows as well, yeah. which is really good. It like, it makes me excited that there's going to be, you know, generations of kids that yeah. are going to listen to so much more, you know, and in that age point going to listen to so much more and discovering new ones and you know maybe not even more passion than us yeah. uh because we're pretty passionate but you know loving it like we do and you know and it's really quite exciting thinking of like people that are gonna join the audiobook industry having listened to books like these throughout yeah. their childhood yeah. um and the kind of exciting things that they're gonna do you know their yeah. own opinions like we've had on what the music was like yeah. what the sound effects were like what the narration was like um what the writing was like and that they're gonna bring all that to making even better ones in the yeah. future which yeah i think is really good and i also wanted to say like this is a good one because they are really quite long and there's four of them. Yes. So it, it's really nice because it's something that kids can get really invested in, you know, and, and whether it's because you've got a long car journey with kids, maybe, um, and you can put one on, you're not going to have to, you know, stop after an hour and be like, oh, man, what do we do now? Yeah. <laughs> you know, they're going to keep you going for a while. And also, you know, if you've got really um, voracious listeners that, you know, kids that love fiction, love stories and want more, 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 you know, there's a good amount of audio here to keep them going. And we can certainly say that it finishes off well. Um, and we're going to assume that the first three books are um, are pretty good too. So, yeah, a strong recommendation from me too, I think, even with some slight criticisms. <laughs> so it's a strong recommendation for me too. It's the only children's title on the list. So I've, that's going to be interesting how the judges will view it because of that. But, yeah, um, 
I just want to say kind of one last thing. We we talked a little bit about the ending. Uh, we don't want to give any too too many spoilers no, no. away, but it's just kind of like you think it's telling one story, but uh, at the end you realize, oh, it's it a good really twist. meta, and it's telling like yeah, oh, yeah, it does so, it goes yeah. so meta? Yeah. And I really loved this discussion in there about why stories are important. Uh, which I thought was, yeah, really yeah. good. And good, quite intellectual, you know, yeah. but in a way that, you know, not inaccessible for kids, like we've just been talking about, accessible, but also in a way where as um, as a kid, I think you being told why stories are so important and you can identify with that having just listened to a great story. Yeah. And like as an adult, and certainly for me as an adult that works in publishing and loves stories so much, could really connect with it in, in, in yeah. another way as well. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, um that's two firm recommendations from us. The next two audiobooks we're going to be reviewing are The Lord of the Rings by J.R.R. Tolkien, as narrated by Andy Serkis, and Sandman Act Two, as narrated by a uh, full cast. So uh, look out for that one, guys. Yeah. Um, as ever, thanks for listening. This is a really exciting thing for us to be kind of one of one of the official partners for the British Book Awards. Yeah. And um, yeah, uh, you can email us at uh, audiobookishpod at gmail.com and you can follow us on uh, social media at audiobookishpod. Thank you guys and uh, goodbye. Bye. Bye. Bye.